This next game is played a couple years later, against a strong Russian grandmaster named Sam Polotnik. Once again you'll see my love for attacking chess all over the board. Sam is a great technical player, well educated in the Russian school of chess. In order to make the tone of the game be in my style, I chose to mix it up right from the start. I also want you to notice that it isn't easy to win against a strong grandmaster. Even if we dominate the opening and middle game, we usually have to win in the end game. I had the white pieces and this game was played in the Manhattan Chess Club when I was 21 years old. I played e4, c5, knight f3, d6, the Sicilian, d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4, this is the open Sicilian, most aggressive way to play against it, knight f6, knight c3, and here Sam played a6, the knight or variation. Now I had expected Sam to play the Alicon, a different opening, which begins e4, knight f6. So when he went into the Nidorf, I wanted to mix it up right away. Make it interesting, unusual. Go for the attack right from the start. I played an unusual variation, rook g1. My idea with this move, of course, is to set up the move g4. It becomes obvious my king is not going to castle kingside. My plan is going to be to play the move g4. My rook and queen both defend that square now. So if he takes it, knight takes, rook takes, bishop takes, queen takes. I've won bishop and knight for rook and pawn. That's much better for me, because the two minor pieces are much stronger than a rook in the early part of the game. So my plan is to play g4, g5, kick his knight, develop my pieces like this, maybe open up like this. Queen can come out. I'm going to castle queen side, and I'm going to build up a big king side attack. That's basically what I want to do. He played the move knight c6. He thought he was stopping g4, but I played g4 anyway. Once again, a pawn sacrifice right from the beginning of the game. I'm giving up a little bit of material to play for an attack, development, mixing things up. Here my next move would be g5, kicking out his knight. This is typical of the Sicilian. White can build up a kingside expansion so the black king can't comfortably castle kingside because that would be where I'm aiming in my attack. When Sam played knight c6, he thought that if I play g4 now, he can take on d4, queen takes d4, and just take the pawn because he's removed the defender. In fact, it's not so simple, which you'll see in a minute. When I played g4, Sam was surprised. He thought deeply. He might have seen some of my ideas, but he didn't see them all, because he made a mistake next move. But here he played h6. His idea is stopping g5. One principle of defense is this. If you move a pawn on the side you're going to be attacked, usually you're exposing a new weakness. Here, h6. I played h4. So if you compare this position, me playing g5, to this position, and me playing g5. Here in both cases, he'll have to move the knight back to d7. In one option, the pawns are on the board, like this. In another option, the pawns are off the board. A major difference is the move g6. You see, if my pawn had been on h2 and his pawn on h7, he could just take it with his h-pawn. But now, he has much bigger weaknesses. If I am allowed to take this, he'll have to take with the king, and his king is wide open, can't castle queen sides. He's in big trouble. I'll have a big attack with moves like bishop c4 check, queen f3 check. This is going to hurt. And if he takes on g6, I'll have the e6 square for my knight, an incredible piece. I can take on g6 with my rook if I want to. I've got some good holes to play with. So after h6, h4... The threat of g5 is becoming even stronger than it was beforehand. Sam really believed he could take on g4. He played knight takes d4, queen takes d4, and here he made a move which was a big mistake, missing my main tactical plan. He played bishop takes g4. His other option would have been knight takes g4. And this was a pure pawn sacrifice. I have no immediate win, no immediate way to get back material. My plan was to play knight d5, an excellent centralized piece. Notice I'm also aiming for the b6 square. 
And then if he makes the move like bishop to e6, knight b6, attacking his rook, he plays something like knight e5. Well, do you see what he's threatening? If I play knight takes a8, what should black play here? Knight f3 check. Very strong. A fork. I lose my queen. So I have to defend that. I play bishop e2. He might go back. Knight c6. Queen e3. Rook b8. And now we have this interesting game. I'm down a pawn. His development is kind of blocked up. I can play moves like f4 and f5. I can play bishop d2 to c3. My knight is very strong on b6. He can't kick it out. I have a rook on an open file. This is good compensation for the material. This is what you have to be willing to do if you're going to be an attacking player. Be willing to give up a little bit of material for long-term positional and attacking chances. This is my kind of chess position. Here Sam played bishop takes g4. Now keep in mind, this is a very strong grandmaster I'm playing against. It's unusual for them to make big mistakes. But something happens in the air when you dictate the tone of the battle. When you determine from the very beginning, when you say this is going to be an aggressive game, a tactical game. Maybe he wanted to play positionally, try to win a long, strategic endgame against me. He's the more mature player, after all. But after bishop takes g4, Sam fell right into my idea. Themes to keep in mind are the black king is open. Look at that a4 to e8 diagonal. His bishop can come back and defend it. Fine. Maybe we can get rid of that bishop. His rook is only defended by his queen. This is an unusual tactic. Let's move one move closer. Rook takes g4. I sacrifice the exchange. He plays knight takes g4. So now he's up an exchange and a pawn. You see what my move is, though? Queen a4 check. And now you see. Black is in trouble. Here Sam played b5. The key is to understand my idea after queen d7. So take a minute here. Here I use an unusual idea. His pawn on a6 is pinned to his rook on a8. His queen is defending the check. But I had the very powerful idea in mind, bishop to b5. I'm winning the queen if he doesn't take it. He has to play a takes b5. But now his rook is hanging. a takes b5. After a takes b5, what do I do? Exactly. Queen takes a8 check. He only has one legal move. Queen d8. Now what? Should I trade queens? Absolutely not. Here I have the attack. His king is stuck in the middle. I have all the momentum. And he's actually up a pawn. I should never trade queens here. My move would be queen takes b7. Now I've evened up material. But his king is exposed. His pawn on b5 is going. If he makes a move like e6, now I can take on b5. Either with my queen or with my knight. Now I'm up a pawn. And now, more importantly than being up a pawn, I have moves like knight c7 check coming, and my a pawn can shoot up the board fast. a4, a5, a6, a7, a8, make a queen. There's a saying, rooks belong behind past pawns. This is my past pawn. My rook is already poised behind it. Here, black is in huge trouble. And he cannot castle away, because after a move like bishop e7, I can play knight c7 check, make the king move, and now it takes a long time for him to be able to bring his rook in. Moves like a4, king g8, a5, king h7, a6. Now his rook is finally in the game. My knight controls the a8 square. Black's in big, big trouble here. That was my idea. Sam played b5. Now it's your move. Looks like he shut down my whole queen attack. White to move. What should I play? Don't let your attack get derailed so easily. Sacrifice. Knight takes b5. Once again, you see my idea. Knight takes b5. A very strong move. 
And now I have a bunch of threats. For one thing, the knight can move with a discovered attack anywhere I want to. Knight d4, knight c7 check, knight d6 check. You see the queen opened up in the king? The king has nowhere to go. If he takes on b5, what should white play? Exactly. Bishop takes b5 check. And now he is ruined. The king can go nowhere. He has to play queen d7. So after knight takes b5, Sam played e6. If he would have played queen d7, what could I do here? Exactly. Knight c7 check. The black king and black rook are both threatened. If the queen takes the knight, oh wait, it can't. It's pinned to the king. So the only move for black to make is king d8. And now this rook is being taken. Knight takes a8 would be a big mistake. We win the rook, but we've lost our queen. He can take it. We have to weave through the tactics correctly. Here I trade queens. Queen takes d7, king takes d7, and knight takes a8. You see how we've used the principles in this position? We usually, when we're up material, we want to trade queens. In this situation, we traded queens right before we were about to win material. Same principle, in reverse order. Here we're up a piece. Black has little development. We're winning the game, no problem. Here Sam played e6. Now I have discoveries. My knight can move wherever it wants to with a discovered check. I played knight c7 check. He played king e7. Knight takes a8. Queen takes a8. This is a typical situation. I began with a blistering attack. He fell into a little trap of mine. But grandmasters collect themselves. They're not so easy to beat. Suddenly we have a situation where it's even material. My position is much better though, and I'm eyeing this pawn in a6. I can win it. I have to be willing to convert in an endgame. You cannot beat grandmasters or strong masters or strong chess players at all for that matter in one swoop. It will rarely happen. Usually you'll get a small advantage, and then over time you'll nurse that advantage. It'll change character. The tension will build. You'll build up the dynamic of your game until ultimately his position explodes because it can't quite hold up. That's what having a better game means. Here, I started off with a boom. Now his king is stuck in the middle of the board. I might win a pawn on a6. I have two bishops. I have an outside pass pawn on a2. If I win this a6 pawn, those are all good, but I have to show excellent endgame technique. Let's finish this game off strong. My first move was bishop e2. What's Sam's point here? If I take on a6 with my queen, what should he do? What space did I leave behind? Exactly, the e4 pawn. He can play queen takes e4, check. My queen was defending that pawn. And now suddenly, black is in the attack. You see, bishop takes a6 is the kind of move you have to be nervous about. My bishop is pinned to my queen, and I've locked down all my pieces around the simple idea of winning a single pawn. Now Sam can play the good move, queen a7. Simple. Attacking the f2 square. My queen can't jump into the defense because it's locked down defending the bishop on a6. He's threatening it with his knight on g4 and queen on a7. Next move is going to be queen takes f2 check. The only way to defend that is to play bishop e3. But then after knight takes e3, f takes e3, queen takes e3, things have definitely gone wrong. I don't want to go there. So here, his threat actually is queen a7, going after the f2 square. If I'm impatient in this position, and this can happen easily, if I had thought that, okay, I've got this win locked up, early in the game it looked great for me, I didn't make any real mistakes, my opponent just defended very well. There are a lot of defensive resources in the chess game, and strong players will always find them. So here, I can't be impatient, I can't try to win right off the bat. What I have to do is take my time, consolidate my advantage. I have certain long-term pluses in this game. I've got two bishops. He's got a weak a6 pawn. My queen is active. 
His king is stuck in the middle. Good. Let's consolidate. First I played bishop e2. Now if he moves his knight to e5, fine. His a6 pawn will be a real problem for him. He played knight f6, eyeing that e4 pawn. Now I played bishop d3, consolidating even a little bit more. At this point, I've kicked his knight off of the g4 square where it was eyeing f2. He can't play knight back to e5, his knight is stuck on f6. It's hard for him to develop. Now my next move can be bishop e3, bishop d2, or bishop f4, followed by castle and queenside. I'm building up my development, getting my king to safety, and only then can I go after this long-term weakness, the pawn on a6. Here, put yourself in black shoes for a minute. Obviously, I've taken control of the game early. He's got this weak pawn on a6, he's got this king on e7. His king isn't going to castle, that's where it's going to stay. The main problem for black is his development. His bishop on f8 is blocked in, his rook on h8 has nowhere to go. My plan is pretty simple. I can play bishop d2, bishop e3, bishop f4, castle queenside, build up my pressure. He has to do something in fast. Put yourself in black shoes. What would you play? Think about opening up the king's side, bringing your pieces into the game. What's the best move? Good. Here Palotnik played a move g5 that's typical of the strong grandmaster. He's opening up play on the king's side, forcing me to deal with an issue. I have to take on g5 or not. If I don't, he will always have the option of taking on h4 and playing rook g8. If I play h5, I have that weakness for his knight. If I do take on g5, then when he takes back, he's opened up his rook coming down to h1. I still have a good game here, but I have to make a critical decision. I played the move bishop d2. I analyzed this game pretty deeply, and I think that in fact h takes g5 would have been a possibility for me, although dangerous. h takes g5, bishop takes g5, rook h1 check, I would play the move bishop back to f1. So he suddenly activated his rook, and now he'd play the move bishop to h6. This is the best way for black to do it. He can't allow that pin on his knight on f6 to his king on e7 to remain in the game. And after bishop h6, I can take on h6, rook takes h6, and you see, I'm up a pawn. The move that I missed here is the very strong e5. This would have been a really great way to play. His rook on h6 is hanging, his knight on f6 is kind of loose, if he moves his knight, I can take on d6. Whenever I want to, I can castle queenside. Here he's got a real problem. If he plays d takes e5, do you see my idea? This is one of those dynamic attacking positions. You have to look at all the lines, diagonals, files. Well done. Queen a3 check. A very strong move. His king has to go somewhere, and if he goes to e8, I can use the same kind of dynamic I used in the very beginning of the game. Remember, he missed the b5 square because his rook was on a8 pinned in the very beginning? Here I can play the move bishop b5 check. If he takes on b5, what do I do? Exactly. Queen takes a8. The pawn was pinned. And if he plays king d8, now what? No, that's not the best move. Try again. No, that's not the best move. Try again. Here I have a fork, a skewer, all at once. My queen jumps deep into his game. Queen f8 check. Wins. If his knight goes back, I can just take it. And after king c7, what do I play? Exactly. Queen takes a8. I've won the queen, and I win the game. So, if you go back, in this position, e5 would have been an incredibly strong move. He just can't take it, because after queen a3, king e8, you've already seen bishop b5, and if he goes king d7, I castle queenside with check, and now he's in huge trouble. I've got that whole attack going, his pawn on a6 is still 
under attack and get taken whenever I want it. If he plays knight d5, blocking, what do I do? Attack the pinned piece. White's move. What's the best move? Exactly. c4. The knight is attacked. If the king moves, I take it. What if black tries to hold on by playing queen c6, pinning my pawn on c4? So his knight on d5 is pinned to his king, but my pawn on c4 is also pinned to my king. The difference is, I have all the time in the world. White to move. What should I do? Right. King b1. Next move, I can take his knight, and his knight can't run anywhere because his king will come under attack. So in this position, he can't play knight d5 because I would play c4. He has to move his king somewhere, say king c7, and now he's in huge trouble. I can make moves like queen e7 check, queen a5 check. I've got a bishop, a rook, a queen, knifing down on the king. The win here is easy. It's all over. If I play e5 in this position, in fact, I'm forcing black to simplify into a good endgame for me. He has to play queen e4 check. He's got no choice. Of course, this is violating the principle of when you're down a pawn trading queens, and he's going to be down a pawn. On the other hand, it's playing by the principle of when you're under a terrible attack, trade queens to stop the attack. In this situation, that's the more relevant principle. I would take on e4, knight takes e4, then I can take on d6. He can take on d6 with his king. I can always play rook d1 check. I can take the pawn on a6 whenever I want to. In this situation, I don't need to castle here anymore because, remember, now it's the end game. We want our king to be in the middle of the board. I'm up a pawn. Maybe two to come. This position is great for me. I could have done this. So I would have played h takes g5 had I seen the e5 shot. In this situation, I chose to keep the pressure on my opponent, though. I played bishop d2. My idea is more positional. I'm going to play bishop to b4, go after the d6 pawn, target this a6 pawn, slowly build the pressure on his game. He played bishop to g7, and I castled. Once again, you see the power of a grandmaster. He was in trouble, and he's still in trouble, but he's making a big fight of it. I have to keep on outplaying him in order to win. He played rook b8, generating an attack. He's aiming for the b2 pawn here. You see, if his knight moves out of the way, his bishop would go after b2. I can't allow that. No discoveries. If I take on g5, I'm taking a big risk. Here he can make a move like knight takes e4, or knight to g4. Knight takes e4 actually is very strong. It's a discovery. After bishop takes e4, bishop takes b2 check. King b1, and here suddenly I'm in big trouble. His bishop can move wherever it wants to, opening up a check. This will be terrible. In this kind of situation, you want to look for a way to defend and attack at the same time. His rook on b8 and his bishop on g7 are knifing down in the b2 square. I played the very strong move bishop to b4. You see this blocks his rook's line of assault on the b2 pawn, and it opens up my bishop's attack on his d6 pawn. Defend and attack at the same time. That's always the ideal response. He played knight e8, defending the d6 pawn. A good decision. He's also opening up his bishop's attack on b2. We've reached a positional stage of this game. I played c3, consolidating my king, creating a good blockade against his bishop's line, and this pawn on a6 can get taken whenever I want to. Notice that's hanging in the air. I don't need to rush it. It's very hard for him to defend that pawn. And very often in chess, the threat is stronger than the execution. Here, the threat of this pawn means he might have to tie himself down on it. Moves like rook b6 or knight c7. But his knight is needed for the d6 pawn. His rook is needed for counterplay. If he spends all his time defending that pawn, then I can build up the pressure on his game. If he doesn't defend it, I can take it when I want to. No need to rush it there. Here he decided to defend it. A good example. The threat was stronger than the execution. He played rook b6. If he takes on h4, I should note, 
I would play the move f4. This was my idea. Once again, you see I'm not playing materialistically. I could have at any moment taken his pawn on g5, traded off, and then taken his pawn on a6. Instead, I built up the pressure. If he takes on h4, I would play f4. Next move can be e5. You see, my bishop is pinning his pawn on d6. His king is stuck in the middle. This oat line is opened up. This a6 pawn is very weak, and now the h4 pawn is also very weak. Moves like e5 will pry open his king. A great position for white. And now he played rook b6. A mistake. He's trying to lock down that a6 square. I'll give you a hint. First I played h takes g5, h takes g5. He's just given me something. Whenever your opponent makes a move, look for what the weakness is. What have they left behind? What have they exposed? Here, his pawn on g5 is hanging. His rook on b6 is hanging. Put those together. White to move. Don't move until you see it. Queen a5, yes, excellent. I'm going after that rook, but most importantly, my queen is slicing all the way across the board onto the pawn on g5. You see how I increased the pressure on his game, made him create a small weakness, the rook on b6, and then I exploited it. Here he played queen b7, defending the rook. I jumped over and took that pawn. Queen takes g5 check. Bishop f6. Okay, now I went back to a5. I maintained all the pressure on his position. His knight is still on a funny square over there. His bishop can't move so well. My bishop on b4 and pawn on c3 create a wonderful blockade against his rook on b6 and queen on b7. The positional dynamics are very good for me now, and I'm up a pawn. You see, I didn't take the pawn until I could do it without compromising the positional elements of my game. This is good chess technique, and this is what it takes to beat a grandmaster. You can't just win right off the bat. Don't expect to get an early attack going and win. If you get an advantage, that's wonderful. You still have to play with wonderful technique and head for the end game. That's usually where you can convert an advantage most effectively. Here my idea is f4 and e5. Palotnik didn't really know how to relieve the pressure on his game without making some kind of trade. f4 was coming fast. He played bishop to e5, stopping f4. But bishop e5 also falls into a pin. Take a moment. Look at it. Think about that theme that we've been developing in this attack throughout. Remember early, his pawn on a6 was pinned to the a8 square. Then later on, it was pinned again to the a8 square. Well, now his pawn on d6 is defending this bishop on e5. Now, Plotnik didn't lose material here, but he allowed me to weaken his king position just a little bit more. I played the very strong move. Queen takes e5. His pawn is pinned. He can't take it. Of course, Sam saw this. He's a grandmaster. He played rook takes b4, removing the defender. Basically, if I take back the rook now, here, what should Sam play? Of course, exactly. D takes e5, and I lose my queen. What my idea had been here is after rook takes b4, I can throw in the in-between move, queen g5 check forcing black to compromise his structure just a little bit more. He has to move, make the move f6. If he doesn't attack my queen, if he plays, for example, knight f6, or he moves his king, then I can take his rook. He has to play with tempo, f6. And now his king is feeling the draft. This is another principle to keep in mind. Whenever you're attacking the opponent's king, you want to create as much air flowing towards the king as possible. This f7 pawn was a solid structure. f6 opened up the 7th rank. His king is a little bit looser than it was before. I provoked that small weakness against strong players or against weak players. Little things make a difference. The details are hugely important in chess. This little ripple, queen g5 forcing f6, that'll become very important. I played queen back to d2. And now Sam made a move which is typical of a strong grandmaster trying to defend a worse position. He made an exchange sacrifice. He saw that if he went back with a move like rook b6, he's just in a lot of trouble. I'm up a pawn. I can play rook h1 because of his new weakness, because he played the move f6. Next move I can aim to bring my rook down to h7. 
His king is under attack. He's going to be in a lot of trouble. Instead of allowing that to happen, Sam decided to mix things up. He played rook takes e4. His idea is that by getting rid of that pawn in the middle of the board and allowing the trade, bishop takes e4, queen takes e4, maybe his central pawns would become strong. Here I'm up in exchange, but he's trying to generate a little bit of counterplay and create some way of blockading my structure. You see, I built the pressure on Sam's game. I made little details matter. I forced a little weakness with f6. Eventually I was going to play rook h1. He felt like he had to change things, to mix things up, in order to relieve the pressure, the inevitable attack that's coming at him. So he gave up an exchange. Now I have to use the exchange advantage. Queen takes e4. Now, white to move. Here I'm really up material. What do we know about converting endgame positions when we're up material? Exactly. Trade down. Here, I threaten to push with my attack, pushing his queen back by offering a trade. Queen d4. A strong technical move. If he trades queens, then I take it, and he's all over. My rook is completely dominant against his knight. I can bring my king into the game. I can go after his pawn on a6. He can't defend this position. For Sam to trade queens would be deadly. He has to go back. Queen c6. So you see, because I have the material advantage, I'm able to push him back because he has to avoid exchanges. I use that reality. Queen d4, queen c6. Now, put your rook on an open file. Let's take advantage of that last move he made. Remember he played f6? Here I played rook g1. Sam might have had the idea of playing knight g7 to f5. I wanted to stop his counterplay, begin an assault on his king, put those two ideas together, rook g1. I hope you didn't think about rook h1. That would have been good, it looks like at first, because rook h7, the problem is that I hang that rook. What can black play here? Exactly, queen takes h1. So my rook comes to the only open file it can, stops knight g7, prepares a move like rook g8. Sam played e5, trying to kick my queen out of its central position. Now what should I do? No, that's not the best move. Try again. Attack. Jump into his position. Queen a7 check. Excellent. I'm chasing his king into the open board. If he plays knight c7, what should I do? The power of the 7th rank. Remember I told you a rook on the 7th is called a pig? Here. Rook g7 check. The king has to move, but he has to defend his knight. If he comes up to e6, I take the knight, and I've won a piece. He goes back to d8, the only square that defends the knight. White to move. What should I play? Queen b8 checkmate. Exactly. Sam saw that knight c7 loses the game right away. He played king e6. So now we see that the light squares are his biggest weakness. His king is on e6, his pawns are all on dark squares. I want to chase his king into the open board. That's the key to capping off these types of attacks. Also the center is very important. Sam might want to make a move, if he can, like queen e4. Try to centralize, get some attack of his own. How can I stop that and get ready to infiltrate his light squares on the king's side? Remember, queens can go very long distances. What's my best move? Very good. Here I played queen h7. Stopping queen e4, preparing a move like queen g8 check. Also queen h3 check is in the air. 
I'm guarding the h1 square, so now I can bring my rook up to g8, for example, without allowing him to play queen h1 check. Put all those things together, queen h7 is a very strong attacking and defensive move. Here Sam played queen f3. Now, white to move. How do you continue with it? Remember, this is the kind of position that's the most dangerous. I'm very close to winning. I've been pushing this game the whole time. It's been a great game. I'm playing a very strong player. I'm interested from the win. This is when we have to buckle down and play our very best. Sometimes to convert this type of advantage, we have to make a precise calculation. Sam is basing his moves on the idea that maybe he'll have what's called a perpetual check. In other words, if I bring my rook and queen into the attack with a move like rook g8, which is what I played, he thought that maybe he'd be able to check my king forever. Perpetual check means that he can check me with the queen, and I can move, and he checks me again. In fact, in this position, it's very hard for him to do this. Check. And if he would be able to check me forever, if there was no way for me to get out, you see that e4 is in fact covered by my queen on e4. If he can check me forever, then it's a perpetual check. In this situation, he can't do it. So I played rook g8. He played queen f4 check. I played king b1. And now you see the power of that move, queen h7. You see it's guarding this long b1 to h7 diagonal. That prevents his counterplay. Sam can't check me on e4. My queen guards that square. I'm threatening the knight on g8, and the funny thing is that it's very hard for Sam to defend it. He played knight c7. If he plays queen a4, do you see his threat here? Remember, when your opponent is right on the edge of defeat, it's when he's most dangerous. He has the threat. He not only is defending his knight on e8, he's also threatening queen d1 checkmate. Never get sloppy. I would play b3, defending the mate, pushing his queen back. He goes queen b5. Now again, he wants to jump into f1. No problem. I play c4, defending and attacking. He's got to go back. If he plays queen c6, now he's got no more threats. Remember, my queen on h7 is defending the e4 square and the h1 square. So here I can make a move like, for example, rook f8, preparing queen f7 check or queen g8 check. It's all over. The attack's going to be too strong. He'd have to make a move like queen d7, in fact. And now I can decide whether I want to trade into a winning endgame by queen takes d7, or play a move like queen h3 check, continuing the attack. Black's counterplay is gone, and white's winning. Playing queen a4 would have been too much of a concession for Sam. It would have been basically admitting he's down material and he has to be completely passive. He decided instead to play the move knight c7. Basically, that was a dare. Take it. He's saying to me, I think I have perpetual check. This is the moment where you do a calculation, you believe in yourself, you figure out if in fact your opponent can perpetual check you, or if you can see your way out. Here I saw my way out. So what do you think? Should I play queen takes c7 or no? If you can, you should. That's a hanging knight right there. You can't rely on your opponent's judgment. If you think you can get out of check, if you calculate it carefully, if you've been putting pressure on him and if he's desperate, don't believe that you can't take the knight. Believe that you can. I did a deep calculation. I was confident in it. I played queen takes c7. Queen e4 check. King c1. And here he played queen e1 check. If he'd played queen f4 check instead, I saw that I could get out after king d1. Queen f3 check. King c2. Now he can take this, for example. Queen takes f2, or he can play queen e2 check. It doesn't really matter. And now after king b3, queen b5 check, king a3, no more checks other than queen c5, but I can take that. No perpetual check, I'm up a rook, and I win the game. He played queen e1 check, I played king c2, and now he resigned. He saw the same variation. Queen e2, king b3, or queen takes f2, King b3, no more checks here. 
There's no way for to perpetual check. My king can just run to safety. So if you think about what it really took to win this game against a strong Grandmaster, it took a lot of things. For one thing, I made a big risky decision in the opening. I played rook g1, preparing the move g4. A big attacking decision. He made a little bit of a mistake. He missed my tactic. He took it. Then I sacrificed, played queen a4 check, because I understood that I could play bishop to b5, utilizing this pinned pawn on a6, a very unusual tactic. But then Sam, like the strong grandmaster he is, brought his defenses together. He began a counterattack. He played g5, sacrificed a pawn, got ready to bring his rook into b8, generating counterplay. But I had long-term advantages in this position. I didn't try to win that a6 pawn right away. I played bishop b4, blocked his rook. I played c3, consolidated, locked down against his bishop. I zoned in on the pawn on d6. I built the pressure in his game. And remember this idea. The threat is stronger than the execution. I didn't take that a6 pawn right away. I let him defend it. I made him defend it. And then once he defended it with rook b6, I used that hanging rook to bring my queen to a5 and to shoot it over to the king's side, to g5. Then, with little differences, I provoked that weakness, the pawn coming to f6. Remember, when I took on e5, I was provoking queen g5, checked the pawn to f6. That was a weakness I'd use later. Then I brought my rook into activity, brought it to the back rank. I made my queen be both an offensive and a defensive piece. And ultimately, I increased the tension on his game until he was forced to sacrifice an exchange or else he'd get squashed in the endgame. I took the exchange, then I used, again, principles of the endgame to increase my advantage. I played queen d4, gave him the chance to trade queens. I pushed him back because queen trades were bad for him. I brought my rook to an open file, took a very aggressive position. Slowly, slowly, I increased the advantage until he felt like he had to give up a piece in order to try desperately for perpetual check, and that was the moment for me to move from the abstract into the concrete. I calculated deeply. I saw that no matter what, however he checked me, my king could escape to b3 and a3, because once again my queen on c7 was being a great aggressive piece and also a great defensive piece, covering the key c5 and a5 squares. My king on a3 would be safe, and I'd win the game. Constant decisions. Patience. Building up the tension. Never giving up the edge when you're trying to convert an advantage. And loving the game. Playing in the spirit that moved me the most. That was how this game worked. I hope you enjoyed it.